Hello, and thank you for joining us today at the BYU Library Family History Webinar Series. I'm Marin. I'll be your host for this webinar. If you uh, need any help uh, with technical difficulties or have any comments or suggestions, you're welcome to use the chat feature. Uh, if you have your mic and video camera on, uh, please disable those for a smooth and um, enjoyable presentation. Today we'll be having a presentation with James Tanner on super maximizing maps for genealogy. Uh, next webinar um, in February will also be with James. Um, he'll be giving a presentation entitled, Are You Due for a Gene Genealogy Tune-Up? So that'll be next Thursday the 7th at 3 p.m. Mountain Time. And um, if you would like to see a recording of this webinar, it will be made available at the end of the week. It'll be on our YouTube page and our website. Um, and if uh, you can't find that um, by next week um, or you have any other problems, you can email at FHL underscore webinars at BYU.edu. And our website um, also has all the webinar information, uh, including this February's um, schedule. And um, our previous webinar on Scandinavian research uh, is on its way on, on getting uploaded to the website. So if you're looking for that, it will be on there soon. Um, and just a reminder that after the presentation, that's when we'll have our Q&A. And if you have any other comments or suggestions, just remember you can use the chat feature. Um, James Tanner has a bachelor's degree in Spanish and a master's degree in linguistics from the University of Utah. He received a, a Juris Doctor's degree in law at Arizona State University. He served two years as an intelligence analyst for the U.S. Army and 39 years as an Arizona trial attorney. He has previously owned a retail computer business and an Apple Macintosh software company. James has over 32 years of experience in genealogical research and is an avid blogger of Genealogy Star blog and Rejoice and Be Exceeding Glad. He served 10 years as a missionary at the Mesa, Arizona Family Search Library and is currently serving at the BYU Family History Library. James has presented at expos and conferences around the U.S. and Canada. Uh, he has seven children and 33 grandchildren. So if James is ready, uh, we'll get the presentation started. Howdy, this is James Tanner. Glad to be with you today. Uh, one little correction, we now have uh, 34 grandchildren and one great-grandchild. So we are still oh, watching that number grow. Uh, let's see, let's get into the presentation. There we go. Today we're going to be talking about super maximizing maps for genealogy. You might realize that I have a uh, rather vested interest in making sure that uh, uh, people understand the connection between the physical location of, a, of an event in a ancestor relative's life and the ability to find and identify that ancestor. And so the theme of this, uh, besides uh, showing a lot of different mapping programs, is that these maps are tools that you can use to verify that you have the right person. Um, it's very, very common that you will find people with the similar, same or similar name. And when you have a, the same or similar name in a, a relatively small geographic area, it becomes more and more and more important to uh, identify the exact location of events in that person's life in order to differentiate that person from all the other people who may have uh, the same or similar name. Uh, it's, it's really difficult to understand that concept because when we're in our lives, we think that our names are unique because, oh yeah, because I'm the only person in the world that, that has this name. And uh, it's sort of a process in life and learning that your name is uh, far from unique. Uh, and basically you can find out that people have that name 
thousands and thousands of people may have your same name. Okay, we're going to start out with the premise here that the entire surface of the Earth has been mapped. Now, the, historically, obviously, this was not the case. Uh, there was there were times in the older maps. Uh, the older the map is, the less accurate geographically it's going to be, because simply because of the of the uh, uh, technology that was involved. In addition to that. Um, the larger the area covered by the map, the less accurate it will be. Uh, one of the struggles that, that occurred over time was, it was representing a round earth on a flat surface map. And this is, of course, the subject of another uh, discussion, another uh, webinar. But uh, this basically has been the, the issue as we look back on, on historical maps. Now, we can't dismiss the maps at all because uh, part of the problem that we have in identifying uh, our ancestors is that places on the face of the earth have changed names. See, they've changed countries, they've changed languages, they've changed uh, everything. The only thing that really hasn't changed is the fact that the event occurred at a physical location identifiable on the face of the earth. So, but our, our challenge is finding out the names and how they how those names may have changed uh, what was called something by our our ancestors may not be the same place it is today and of course political boundaries have changed considerably and continue to change constantly um, so uh, for example if you were a person uh, who happened to be living in uh, in Central America and were born in the canal zone you would no longer have a country a uh, canal zone would not be on anyone's map. Uh, it does not exist. And so that's, uh, that's just a, one of, of thousands and thousands of examples of, of changes such as that. So when we go to, uh, to, into the mapping world, uh, we need to understand that there are hundreds and hundreds of thousands of historical maps. Maps have been drawn since uh, the earliest records some of the earliest documents we have uh, could, be, could be interpreted as maps. And so what we have are, are this huge reservoir of maps. And an interesting thing about these historical maps, <clears throat> particularly when we're talking about uh, doing genealogical research, is that, uh, well, you know, for example, we talk about genealogically important records, and we know that a lot of those records are being digitized and put online on different websites around the world. So we think, begin to think that, that all the records have been digitized. Well, only a very small percentage of records uh, that are uh, uh, valuable for, geneolo for genealogists have been digitized. But now we get to maps and we find out that, that overwhelmingly, almost any kind of conceivable map of any place that you can think of has probably been digitized and put online. So maps are kind of an exception to the rule about there always being better records out there on paper uh, that you have to go look for and find. Uh, usually you can find uh, a map of almost any spot on the face of the earth, face of the earth for almost any time period uh, when that's available. Okay, so the next step that we're into is um, understanding this principle in that genealogists can increase the accuracy of their research by specifically locating ancestral events and making sure that place names associated with those events are both reasonable and accurate. Okay, so this is kind of the rule of, of how we're going to relate the, uh, the maps uh, to our genealogical research. And the, the classic example is a person that I, I've seen a similar type of, of reference to a person and I just ran into one uh, the last two days on, a, on, on the familysearch.org family tree. And that is a person identified by one name, in this case, uh, the generic name Mary, uh, and the birthplace was not given and the date was about 1840. And, uh, uh, other than that, uh, that's all the information we had about that person. And 
In some cases, it may be a little more specific, like Ohio. Uh, how many people they marry do you think were born in Ohio uh, in that in a time period of about 1840? Uh, even if you wanted to guess at that, there's no way in the world that that that, that particular reference can ever be that person can ever be identified. Now, it is my experience after many many years of of helping people with their genealogy and examining literally thousands of pedigrees, that most of the, that searching in the wrong place is the number one issue for genealogists who can't find an ancestor. And it's almost inevitable that we have, uh, the places are mixed up. It's not, and if you can't find the right place, you can't find the ancestor. So. We spend more time looking for records and looking and making sure that we've identified the place that our ancestor lived than we do in actually coming up with information about the ancestor. I think it's the, it, it is really the most challenging part of the process. Now, here's an example taken from the family search family tree of a, uh, uh, of a wrong place. Uh, it looks reasonable. Here's a person named uh, Jeremiah Brown, uh, born about uh, 1735, and he's from a place called South Kingstown, Washington County, Rhode Island, United States. And he has uh, three sources. Tells us that somebody thought that they had uh, a record that showed uh, that this is, this is the case with this person. Uh, so what's basically wrong with uh, this particular entry? Uh, well, we look at the date and look at the place, and how do I know it's the wrong place? Because the United States did not exist in 1735. Okay, now there's constantly this, this kind of blowback from that position. The basic rule is that the place is recorded, and I'm going to say this more than one time because I'll probably repeat it during the whole presentation. But the idea is that we record the location of an event as it was <clears throat> at the time the event occurred. Now, what that means is that uh, if the United States did not exist in 1735, then we have to come up with a different name. And why is that the case? That's because records were kept by people who lived at or near the time of the event and recorded it either because they were interested or because they had a duty to report it. And I'm gonna come say that again too, because that's a rule that you need to remember um, of, of how this all works. So the idea here is we need to have and find out where did Jeremiah Brown live and uh, is, if, that's the, if we have the correct information. Uh, so here's the general rule, and I'll repeat it again. Places need to be recorded as they existed at the time the event occurred. We have to think about that. How do we know what they were called? Well, that's why we do research. We look at uh, records that we have available, and I'm going to go through a series of, of websites that will help you and give you uh, additional information so that you can identify uh, the, geo the political entities that are occurred. Uh, when you spread that around the world, then you come into major challenges. Uh, for example, one major challenge in Europe is uh, designating the countries uh, that as they changed and as they existed politically over time. Uh, even in a, a country such as Germany, for example, which is uh, fairly identifiable today, uh, go back into the mid 1800s, and there really was no place that they could call Germany. And so, coming up with the uh, name of the location or the political designation for the location of the of an event can be a, a major historical research challenge. Okay, so moving on into the the issues here, should this one should this particular uh, place be designated as South Kingstown, Washington, Rhode Island, British Colonial America. So here's the other question. When was Rhode Island, are we talking about Rhode Island as a colony of the, of the British Empire? 
or are we talking about uh, when was Washington County organized? What was the county before it was organized? Was it a county in the time uh, that this person was supposedly born? And or the same information about the, the town, South Kingstown. When was it established? Uh, how, uh, what time frame uh, did that particular area exist? And all of this can be supported by maps and by lists and by gazetteers and by other tools that relate directly to uh, the issue of forming, uh, of working with the names and doing research into the events and their uh, locations. Uh, okay, so now it's time for some research. This is when we get to this point. Now, recognizing that this is not a uh, correct uh, location designation <clears throat> is, uh, is something that what I do is I automatically assume it's wrong. Uh, I always, uh, until I have, and in the case here of Rhode Island, where I do a lot of research, I have a time, I have a timeline for the towns that I'm dealing with, and I add, and I'll add new towns and counties to my timeline. So I just look at my timeline and say, uh, South Kingston wasn't there in 1735, if that's the case. So uh, and gives me the name of the place that I should uh, that I should substitute. Okay, so we're going to look at the next step, which is South Kingston was town. I think town. Let me say that again. South Kingstown was established in about 1722 to 23. So we can assume <clears throat> that if a person was born about 1735, and that if there was some reason or or some kind of source. Uh, record out there that showed that they were born in that location, uh, then the location existed. So South Kingstown is there. We can leave that. We're not going to worry about it. Okay, let's go to the next one. But Washington County was not established until 1781, so the county's wrong, uh, regardless of whether or not today it would be in that county. We can't assume that we could find historical records in that county because they could have moved. And they may have moved and may be now stored someplace where the, that preceding county was located. So we're going to need to know what county was in a staff when that county was in, in effect back then. So doing some more research, we find out that the previous county was called Kings County. And so is the correct place description, South Kingstown, Kings, uh, British Colonial America. Uh, we throw in Rhode Island. Uh, we would need to know if Rhode Island was or was not a place. It was a colony. Should we have Rhode Island Colony? Should we have the colony of Rhode Island? Uh, these are all decisions that we make. And the idea here uh, from the people who are working in, in in writing genealogical programs and creating uh, these online programs that we use uh, is that they try to come up with standardized ways of referring to all these places uh, that reflect their their names during the time periods that are involved. So if you, uh, in some programs actually, if you put in 1735 and you put in Rhode Island, it'll come up with a bunch of different options uh, that you can standardize on on that. So, for example, that's what family search, the family search .org family tree it does. So, there's others, uh, other uh, the programs do the same thing. They give you suggested uh, places that might occur. And there are programs out there that will correct your answer. If you put in Washington County into some programs, here's an example of like Rich Magic, which is the best spot genealogy program, you would it would come up and say you have the wrong county it should be and it would give king's county as the one that existed at that time so are we done the answer is no we're not done uh, and there's also some uh, considerable discussion over whether or not we use the term british colonial america uh, because there was never a place referred to as british colonial america nobody at the time, 
thought of calling it British colonial America. It was called whatever, New England or Massachusetts or whatever. So they weren't uh, really into that particular uh, title anyway. Sometimes we have to just make an arbitrary decision to, uh, to give uh, a certain amount of information and preserve a certain amount of information. And uh, British colonial America uh, is, is fairly consistently used, uh, but, not, but far from a standard. It's not a standard place name. Okay. Now, looking further at this entry, which of course is nothing that you, that we're gonna be able to do in the context of this presentation, but we find out in looking at the three sources that no, none of those three sources uh, show us any, give us any information at all about Jeremiah Brown's birth. Uh, they talk about his death and burial, but uh, you know, it's, it's probable that, that very few people are going to die in the same place where they got born. They, they made, they may uh, be. Uh, it's possible, I suppose. You want to start arguing about it, but the the issue is that there are uh, we travel and we move, and so we have, we don't know where Jeremiah Brown was born. So why do we have a place there? That's the question. And in this case, I would probably remove the location because we can't assume that he was born in Rhode Island. He may have been born in England, he may have been born in one of the other colonies, but uh, without a source record, we can't assume that that's where he was born. And by doing that, we may uh, influence people to look for a birth record in that Rhode Island colony, and there may never be anything there because he wasn't born there. So that's the reason why we have that earlier statement about uh, naming them as a, a place where he, as they occur, as they were at the time of the event, and also uh, understanding that that's where the records are going to be found, or associated at least with that location. And also, be, just because of the lack of sources and all of this information is suspect. So about 1735 doesn't work, nothing, none of this stuff works. Uh, if we have a death and we had an age at death, then we could calculate uh, a possible birth year. But if absent that, just a, bur a burial record does not give you uh, information about when, how old this person was when they died. So all of this information here is suspect. So uh, first of all, we're gonna look for the places. Now, in this case, we have South Kingstown. And if we, uh, if he was buried there in South Kingstown or died in South Kingstown, then that would be a place to start to look for records because at least we know he was there when he died. Uh, this, of course, brings up the first rule of genealogy uh, once again, and this is really a restatement of the, of the first rule that I just said. And the first rule, is, of course, is that when the baby was born, the mother was there. Okay, so there's, uh, there's three things about that first rule of genealogy, and that is there's, that you, you cannot put your mother in one spot and the baby uh, a considerable bit distance away when the baby was born. That's just not gonna happen, although you'll find that. And I have sat there and, and looked at people in the eye after they told me their story and said, when the baby was born, the mother was there. And they look at me like I'm crazy. And then they start to think and they go, oh, you're right. Okay. But the other important and the colliery of this rule is that um, we look for places first uh, because the records are going to be generated from those places. In this case, if you look at this map, you see this big kind of off color reddish area. That's all South Kingstown. And there are in that South Kingtown many towns. So where are the records? Were all the records of South Kingstown kept as South Kingstown, or were they kept in the individual towns or villages there? Uh, you never can discount the fact that the records you're looking for are actually sitting in a building in one of those small towns. 
So this is why it's important to think about the maps and think about where places occurred. So South Kingstown is not just one town. It's a, it's a whole bunch of little towns. And they're all called South Kingstown because that's the South Kingstown area. It's not a county. It's part of Washington County at present. And it was part of Kings County previously. Okay. This example shows the need for more research. This is the whole point of this particular example is that when we get into these, into these situations and we start to analyze what's, on the, what's there on the paper or on the, on the computer screen before us that someone has put in there or we have put in there unknowingly, that that information is simply not correct and we need to do some research and correct it so that it can be used and, and additional records can be found. Okay, so now we're gonna move on to England. Uh, uh, I'm not going to resolve all of the issues of these examples. This is not the same problems. It's not an example of how to solve the problem per se. Uh, the, the, the problem is solved by doing research. And so the idea is that we're going to go out and find the information from maps and gazetteers and other, uh, and other geographically oriented materials, uh, lists of names of places and, and websites with, uh, with uh, place names which technically are gazetteers. But anyway, so this is uh, what we're gonna do. Now we're gonna move on to England uh, just to give a, more, a different kind of an example here. Okay, so this is, this, the, this particular example that I'm going through is going to illustrate that knowing the exact location of uh, an event in a, in a person's life, ancestor relative's life, uh, will uh, increase the chances of locating that person even with limited um, additional information. So let's see what happens when we look at this. Now we have, I have a little bit of a uh, portion of a pedigree off of uh, Family Search Family Tree. And we see a William Tarbot who was born as uh, what is on there. And I'm not going to say that he was born, but the information indicates a birth date of 1743 and a death date of 1825 and a marriage in 1763 in Goodhurst, Kent, England. And uh, his wife's name and has a father named George who was supposedly, supposedly born in 1715 and a mother named Anne who was born in 1719 and died in 1782. Okay, so from my earlier comment about Mary born in Ohio or born someplace big, uh, you can tell I'm already probably not, not happy with Anne, born in 1719. So let's take a look at what this is going to, to have to be done. Okay, now, just to start out, William Tarbot is, lo is listed with 36 sources. I mean, we're not talking about somebody who nobody's done any work on. He's already got 36 sources listed. Uh, but none of the sources provide either his christening date or a death date. So we have all these sources who, that are based solely on the fact that the name in the record is the same as the person we think we're looking for, William Tarbot. And so how do we know the names of his father and mother? If we now know his birth date or his birth, uh, his christening date, which is in that time period, uh, far more likely to be discovered than a birth date and or a death date. And actually you don't get death dates too often in England at that time period. You would get a, a burial date rather than a death date. Uh, however, given the time period, the death date is always, not always, but almost always very close to the burial date. So burial death date doesn't matter. Christening date is another problem because the christening 
of people in the Church of England could have happened at a time very distant from the date of their birth. Uh, it's not unusual to find records where a person was getting christened in order to get married in the church. And they could have been in their 20s, 30s, or whatever uh, when they're being christened. So, so christening dates do not indicate a birth date at all. They are a christening date. They're not, there's no implication. Very commonly, I see someone will put down uh, the, the same date for the birth date and the christening date. Just think about it, folks. You're telling me that that mother had a baby, leaped up, and ran to the church to have her baby christened. Give me a chance. Give me a break. It's not happening. It's just not happening. Okay, so it's sometime after the birth. Now, there's some people who put in the birth year as the christening year. Mm, maybe, maybe not. But that's still a very poor practice. If you do not have a record showing the birth, leave it out. No harm done. There's no obligation to fill in every blank. We are trying to reasonably identify these people. It's not a game. So we're not just filling in all spaces with numbers. Okay, so here's the here's this location shown by the sources. So I'm going, I'm doing all this work for you. So you would have to go through and look at each source and come up with all this information. So the first place I find in the records is Cranbrook. And I've marked them on the map so you can see kind of uh, generally where they are. Uh, this is, uh, if you look, look at the upper left-hand corner of this uh, map segment that I've uh, screenshot, map segment that I've created, you'll see London. So that'll kind of give you an orientation of where you are in, in England. If you're so unfamiliar and you don't know where London is, go get a map, pull up Google Maps and look for London, and then you'll figure out where we're talking. Let's just assume that uh, we have some concept here of Cranbrook. Okay, the next place in the map is Goodhurst. I mean, excuse me, in the list of sources is Goodhurst. So we have another place. Uh, if you look at, if, you, if you've been staring at this, you'll see that it, it moved a little bit, but they're pretty close to each other. And so that's one thing that we're gonna look at later. And then another place, list, place that's mentioned in the sources is Marden. And uh, this is one that's a little bit more prob problematical because Marden is uh, a parish council, kind of a parish council. It's, it's the name of a, of a lot of different places and different entities in that general area. But there is a village, a town called Marden, and then there's a parish and there's other things there. But it's, it's a little more complicated and doesn't really... Uh, isn't really as easy to identify as the first two. And then we have Canterbury. Um, it's quite a ways away. Uh, it does happen to be in Kent, and uh, we'll just have to see whether we like that or not. Uh, so how far, this is the next question. Okay, we've taken all the names out. If you're like me, then you've either plotted them on the map or you've written them. You've, written them in your notes as all the three or four places that they're there. And then you want to know if uh, how these sources relate to each other. And that is, um, remember the first rule about uh, babies and mothers and all that. Uh, so how far apart are these places? Are the events that occurred reasonable? So that's going to be the question that we're going to address next. So given the time period, which is the mid-1700s, are these distances accept acceptable? What was the world like in, the, in 1750, for example? Think about it for just a second, okay. Uh, jet planes, railroad, fast railroads, uh, cars, freeways, nothing. None of that, folks. Okay, uh, what's a good, good idea <clears throat> here? Well, we think of what we call the Industrial Revolution. Uh, in England, the Industrial Revolution is uh, generally tied to when they first started building railroads. So when were the first railroads in England? These are the questions you start asking when you're working with maps, when you're working with finding the locations that these people live. So when were they? Anybody know that? Raise your hand. Oh, I don't need that. Okay. Um, 
I'll just tell you because obviously you're going to go scramble around and come up with a different number than I will, and I'm just going to throw one out. 1830. Why is 1830 good? Well, there were earlier railroads for mines and things like that, but commercial railroad traffic carrying passengers generally started about that time in England. So by in 1700s, how did you get from place to place? You walked, you rode a horse, or you rode in a wagon, or on a boat. Well, they weren't going to take boats in any of this area uh, unless there were canals, and the canal building was actually going on during this period of time. But uh, it was not generally passenger-oriented at first. It was it was moving, mining, you know, heavy things like mining ore and things like that. Um, so knowing this historical background is just, and that's just, that was nothing compared to what you need to know about the history of these places. But basically knowing that information helps to focus on uh, whether or not the information that you already have is reasonable and whether it works. Okay, so let's move on and see what's happening here. Okay, so here's a map. From Google Maps, I used I use a process on Google Maps that you might use when you're taking a trip, and that is I put in the first location, and then I say drive to the second location, and then I say drive to the third location, and if I want to do it kind of timing wise, I say walk to the second location or walk to. The, I have a little icon on Google Maps for walking, and so how far are these places? So all of the those. Four different places were put on the map, so let's let's figure out where they were. So we have Cranbrook and we have Goodhurst, and we uh, look on the on the Google Maps, and it tells us that it's about five miles apart. Okay, this falls within a general rule uh, that people were born, died, were born, got married, and died within about a six mile radius of where they were born. And uh, interestingly enough, you would think that that expands rapidly into the eight, later 1800s, and in the 1900s, it's got to be thousands of miles or something like that. Actually, not. Actually, huge studies done by uh, by the actually myheritage.com uh, that did a three, 13 million member family tree and used it to do statistics, found that people were still getting married with uh, born and died within a short distance of their own. It, it increased about 50, 15 miles and then collapses down. It's just the way the world works, folks. Um, you know, I'm, And you're gonna say, oh, there's an exception. My grandmother, I married my wife and she lived 300 miles away. Well, yeah, except when you married her, she didn't. <laughs> and so this is, this is kind of the point. Okay, the next place was Marden, and Marden is five miles away. Well, so if Cranbrook's the key point, then Marden's a little bit outside of the realm. If Goodhurst is the key point, then both of those are just at the edge of, uh, of what would be a reasonable distance for uh, looking at events. And so then, what's the next one? Canterbury, and that's out there at 37 miles. Not a chance, folks. The Canterbury outlier is got to be, you've got to come up with a, with a valid source reason why that event that's in the sources would have occurred in Canterbury as opposed to this little cluster of places down here near Cranbrook and Goodhurst. But now we're going to look at the sources a little bit better. And I have, of course, the advantage of having the sources in front of me. So I know what happens. So what we're going to do is we're going to assume that Marden to Canterbury is not likely. So we're going to be searching to see if there is any specific record that indicates why someone would have traveled from either of those three places over to Canterbury for an event, either to die, could have, either to get married, not, not likely at this time period, or for some other reason. Okay, so this is where we're, we're going to deal. Now, as we go through all the sources, we find out that there aren't any sources that put William Talbot in Martin. Where did the name come from? It came from someone who added a source that was about a child or some other person. And so that source starts to 
become less re reliable. We're not really sure that we've got the right William Talbot, that we've got the right uh, place because we just haven't tied William Talbot to Martin. So we're left with Goodhurst and Cranbrook and maybe Canterbury, but maybe not. So let's see what happens here. So what do we do next? Okay, so the, what do we do next is we use a program like findmypast.com and for England. And you can do this to a limited extent with any of the programs or with just Google Maps and, and using it to, to figure out. But, but to get into the databases, you're gonna have to search in a very large database, uh, something that has uh, multi thousands, millions of records, billions of records, so that you can get a, a, an idea of the numbers of people that are involved. So what am I going to do? Find my past is, has uh, uh, millions of records from the British Empire, from the UK, what we call the UK, Ireland, Scotland, Wales, uh, Scotland, uh, England. And uh, we can search in those areas and see uh, sort of uh, a, a give us an idea of the frequency of the person's surname and given name. Okay, so why would that be important? Because what we're doing to do, what we're going to do is we're going to focus in on the larger area, get an idea of the frequency of the surname, then come focus down, focus down, focus down, until we find out whether or not it's even possible that a person named William Tarbot lived in that place. If there are no records showing William Tarbot in that place, it's gone. Okay, so next what we're gonna do is go to findmypast.com. We're gonna log in and uh, we're gonna use this as our uh, search engine to uh, do a general search. How many William Tarbots, starting out with how many Tarbots, were uh, in there in England. Okay, so first of all, we put in a years because we've got 1743 as one of the base years here. And so we're going to uh, say how many Tarbots, ask the program, search and put in parameters that say, tell me how many Tarbots were, were born, uh, show up in your records, period, any kind of record, uh, or born and during the time period from 1743 and or minus, uh, plus or minus 10 years. And the number comes up at 7,200. Okay. If we cut the time period down to five years, and then we add a given name of William, the number drops to 46 results. So it automatically focuses in on, uh, on the results. If I specify Cranbrook, now, this, now 46 is fine. That's like showing darts at a board with 46 different places for it to land, because we don't know where, which one of those William Tarbots we're really looking for. Uh, but if we then know the place, then the results drop to 17. And almost all of those support the William Tarbot who was from Cranberg. So now we have, a, a, just by doing this uh, way of, of filtering out uh, or filtering down to a specific location. And it doesn't matter what order you do these in, but I like to do it in this order because it gives me an idea also about the frequency of the surname. Uh, same with thousands of, of, of hits, means there's lots and lots of people out there with this name. So we're gonna have to be very, very, very specific. If you do, what, if you do this search on a, on a very unusual surname, uh, I've had uh, only a hundred people out of all the millions records on on Find My Past with the set, same surname. So I can individually tell a person. Likelihood is you you are related to all hundred people here because there's that name is so rare. So this is a this is the kind of thing that you do uh, to to find out the if if what you've got there as far as the places are reasonable. And we find that there's no William Tarbot in Martin. So we've got William Tarbot down there in Goodhurst and in Cranbrook, and they're only five miles apart. So we can it, we can begin to say, or at least form a high, uh, fairly uh, reliable opinion that the William Tarbot we're looking for 
uh, came from that little tiny area around uh, Cranbrook and, and Goodhurst. Now here's the real question, where were his present parents from? 1750, and they would be born 20 to 30 years before that, if, let's say wherever, when it, before he was born, and that would be even further back in time, and the chances of them having traveled or coming from, come from some other place was even much lower. So the possibility is that they came from Cranbrook. So is there anyone out there, the question would be, are there any other William Tarbots or any other Tarbots who are candidates to be the parents of William Tarbot? So that's uh, the question we have, is Cranbrook going to end up being the reasonable place? But I would conclude that based on the map and the sources and the analysis in, on Find My Past, that the family was from Cranbrook and that any records I find about Tarbots in Cranbrook probably are people that I'm reasonably, have a reasonable belief could be my relatives. And if I can then find records and concentrate on the Cranbrook records, that if the records exist, then I should be able to find my Cranbrook record, my Cranbrook rec relatives in the records in Cranbrook or whatever parish and surrounding parishes, if that's something else we need to look at. Okay, let's move to another example. Okay, that previous example showed um, focusing in on using the map to give you an idea of the distances involved. And then it also showed you how the map led, led you to the conclusion that the travel distances were such that you probably were focusing on one location and that was where you were finding records about your family, so that's probably self-reinforcing. Okay, so here's another example. In this case, in looking at a family on the Family Search Family Tree, we saw, I saw, I was working with one of my friends, a family with children born in both Kentucky and Tennessee in the early 1800s. Okay, we're back to the same issue of travel time, uh, in fact, it was much worse because in, 18, in the early 1800s in both Tennessee and Kentucky, this was at the very earliest time when the Europeans were going into those, into that area, into those areas, and there weren't any roads. And movement north and south was extremely restricted, and movement from east to west was almost as badly restricted. Uh, if you've driven across the country like I have recently, like in the last couple of months, um, you know that it's a big country and people just didn't walk that far. And so uh, the settlement that came from this was, uh, was slow. So here we are, here was the problem. We had a family that seemed obviously not correct because you had children born in Kentucky and children born in Tennessee in the early in that time period, and so we said, Meh, "I just don't believe this is possible." And so we kept doing some research. So we did more research and more research, and it and it turns out that we found lists of where each of the children were actually born in those different countries and different states. <laughs> okay, so did the mother pick up and back and forth to have babies? And the answer is eh, probably not. Okay, so what? What was the problem? Okay, so this, we went, I, I believe me, how much time it took us. Now, interestingly enough, if I had called my brother, uh, my, one of my sons up and asked him this question, he would have answered it by snapping his fingers said, oh, I know the answer to that. But that was a problem. Okay, so what happened here? Well, this is the problem. This was the border, this is the border between Kentucky and Tennessee. This is zooming in on a little town called Mitchellville. And this happens to be, and you see that red spot there, this happens to be where this family lived. How far did they have to travel to go to Kentucky from Tennessee? 
100 yards. Two, a mile, half a mile away, you were in a different state, the state line. Now, you may not be aware, you think that if you look at a regular map, you're gonna see the straight line between Kentucky and Tennessee. When you zoom in on it, you will find this little jog in the line. It is famous. That's why my son, when I mentioned this to him, he said, oh yeah, that's the so-so uh, jog in the line and the, the weapon, you know, and I went, okay, so I didn't know it. I've never heard of it. He said, well, read some books. And <laughs> anyway, so here's what happened. These, uh, the surveyors were coming along and it got to be a really cloudy day and they couldn't get um, a bearing on the sun and they just kept measuring the line and then they discovered that they were off and so then they turned and went back to get back on the right line and they got back on the right line and then for like oh maybe up until the present day Kentucky and Tennessee still fight over it so it's but it's there and that explained why the children in this particular family it was correct some of them were born in Kentucky and some were in Tennessee and they just took their foot because nobody knew who would end up owning that particular piece of property. And so that's how they got listed. So I guess who or whatever they thought give the better tax advantage or whatever it was. Oh, I see there's a Flying J Travel Center just north of there. Well, no wonder they could live there. Um, I don't know, there's a freeway that goes there too. They, they have pretty good life. They could have lived pretty well back in that time period next to a freeway and near a travel center. Okay, what does that illustrate? It illustrates the fact that, that you really have to know the history. You have to go back in history and look, and you may want to look at an old map because I don't think that Flying J Travel Center was on the old map. Okay, surveyor's error. That's the whole problem with this particular issue, but it was only resolved when we zoomed in on the map to the point, actually the process that we went through was to identify that these people lived in Mitchellville. And um, once we did that, we zoomed in on Mitchellville and realized that the boundary of the state made this weird log. And then we did some research and figured out the story behind it and that it actually did exist. And when it happened, and it was before the time period when the people lived there. So they lived right there on the line, all those people with their, their things. Okay, so we're gonna go through now some, some map sources. Now, here's the deal with these videos when they're on the YouTube. When you're in live, of course, you can't, you could tell me to pause, but I probably wouldn't. Um, but the, uh, when you're on a video on YouTube, you can come back to this and you can pause the video and get the information if you need to get the information. So this is, uh, this is the way this works. So I'm going to go through these fairly quickly. First of all, the, the basic map source is Google Maps. First of all, they have high resolution uh, satellite images of the whole world, which helps us to look at a lot of land. And secondly, they have all these nifty calculations and distances and roads and by walking and how time frames and all that that help us to find. The drawback, partially drop, partial drawback is that um, there are a lot of different places named with the same name. Uh, how many counties are called Washington County, for example, and you can go on and on. Uh, I can make stuff up, like I can say Big Bug Hollow, and I can look it up on a gazetteer, and I will find a Big Bug Hollow, <laughs> almost inevitably. Anything I can think of, they will find possum you know, creek or something, all that's there, everything's there. Okay, so now we're moving on to a little more specific uh, source for help, and that's uh, the uh, USGS, the United States uh, Geological Survey, and it's the national map. How many of you knew we had a national map? We do, and it's very, very detailed, and it goes into tremendous detail and there's lots of other things that go along with it. So the national map, and I'm not giving you URLs here, it's simply look up these places by Google search. If you look for national map, US national map, 
you will find the link directly. If you go to the USGS website, you may or may never find it. Believe me, it's one of those big government sites that's so big and has so a link to all sorts of different things. You may never see the, the connection to it. So just, just do Google search for map, national map. Next one is uh, map source is um, one of the most valuable and most used sources that I use for United States. Now, there are similar uh, resources, not, not quite as well organized, but for all the other uh, problem places in the world and in Europe and every place else. But uh, this is the place for the United States and it's called the Newberry Atlas of Historical County Boundaries. It's by the Newberry Library in Chicago. And it, is, uh, it has an interactive map that shows that, that graphically shows the changing borders of every county since 1620, since actually 1605, starts with Jamestown. And so basically you're, or whenever around that time period where Jamestown starts. So every change in every political boundary, every town, every uh, county and state boundary change is, is graphically illustrated. And then there is detailed information about each of those changes with a citation to the, to the political decision, the statute or ruling or whatever that changed the boundary. So there's just a fabulous amount of information here. The program goes on and on. And I've done some other programs just on that particular map source. Um, old maps online, if you want a sort of inexhaustible supply of old maps. The advantage of this old maps line, and I'm giving you the URL here because if you just type in old maps, you're really going to get all sorts of weird stuff. It's oldmapsonline.org. And the, basically what you do is you draw a rectangle with the, the, on the map, and it will show you all of the historical maps that are available for the area that is in that rectangle. It's amazing. You've got to play with this game, with this program. It's just the number of maps in there is phenomenal. And it's all over the world. And you could get all the historical maps for the world. OK. Uh, other map source, uh, David Rumsey Maps. This is a, a private collector who, who donated his maps uh, for uh, online usage. Most of these maps are freely downloadable. You can get to right to your computer and it's, it's a good place to go look. And there's just, once again, you can search by area and all sorts of things. And there's lots of tools in there for looking at maps and coming up with maps. Um, there are many, many, many more sources uh, for maps. And I just, I think you just go online and you look for maps. I look at maps online and I've got 7 billion, 7.1 billion results. So it's just an inexhaustible supply of maps out there that you can, can look at um, to find what you need. But if you're focusing on a specific part, point, of the world, point on the world, then there are, uh, then that's how you get into the, all of that different information. Okay, well, thank you to, for watching today. Appreciate all you out there. Do we have any questions? All right, the time is open now to ask questions. Please use the chat feature and type your questions in. Um, and just to let everyone know, all of these links that James has mentioned will be posted along with a video. I've uh, searched for them and found all the URLs. Um, so those will be available on the YouTube as well as the website. And it looks like we have a question from Charlene. She asks, are some of these on archive.org? Um. Archive.org does not have a whole lot of maps. It has so many documents that it's hard to say that they don't have a lot of maps. But it's generally not a map site as such. Uh, it, would be, it would be difficult on archive.org to actually find a map that you wanted specifically of a geographic area. That would be kind of a challenge. So old maps online is, is definitely easier and faster to use for the very same, for that purpose. That, oh, that, that answers it. Uh, 
uh, I'm going to hedge my comment there on, on archive.org because there's so much stuff going into archive.org. They're up to like 20 million books. You never know what they have. They just have all sorts of things on there. I love the program. I mean, I use that. That's still in my top five programs that I think's on for any reason on fine. Any other questions? Uh, it doesn't look like we have any others, but we'll wait just a few more seconds uh, to see if um, anyone else has another question. Okay, well, thank you very much for listening. Um, remember that all of these are being posted on our YouTube uh, channel, which is the BYU Family History Library YouTube channel. Go to youtube.com, type in BYU, you know, Bravo, Yankee, Uniform. Um, at Family History Library and do a search on YouTube and it will take you right to our YouTube channel and you'll see we now have over 400 videos. All right, thank you so much everyone for uh, the presentation. Um, it was great to have your presentation and we hope that you uh, use the resources that James has mentioned today. So um, all of our next um, webinars will be on Thursday at 3 p.m. Mountain Time. Um, the next one we have coming up is from James Tanner, and that will be on the 7th. And um, after that, we will be hearing from Michael Hansen. Um, he will be presenting on what to do with old genealogy genealogical materials um, and how you can donate those. So uh, we have heard from um, a bunch of viewers that they've been uh, wanting to know what to do about um, uh, genealogy um, stuff that isn't necessarily theirs um, and we are bringing in an expert. Um, so that will be on Valentine's Day uh, with Michael Hansen and um, it shall be a lovely webinar and we hope to see you then as well as on the 7th. If you have any comments, suggestions or questions, you're welcome to email us at FHL underscore webinars at BYU.edu. Make sure to check our YouTube channel if you just uh, search in YouTube uh, BYU FHL um, that'll pull up our channel and um, the most recent webinar as well as the previous webinars will be available there. Thank you so much and we hope you have a wonderful weekend.